Good morning, Victory. Come, now is the time to worship. Join the band with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Stand up. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me
There's nothing to fear now, for I am saved. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted, I, oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every fear, I lay at your feet. I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. see are the ashes you see the beauty thank you God when all I see is a cross God you see the empty tomb so when I fight I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God the battle belongs to sing to the night oh god the battle belongs to you almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadow you win every battle Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Sing it, church. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every fear, I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Sing it again. When I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear, I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Whoa, God, the battle belongs to you. Whoa, God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. Good morning, Victory. How are we doing today? Oh, man, that was weak. That was a little lame, too. I, I don't know about that. I don't think they realize that the battle belongs to God, so let's try it again. How are we doing today? All right, there we go. Looking like a, like a WWE atmosphere. I like it. So let's go ahead and kick things off. First things first is if you're a newcomer here, we have a little welcome gift for you. Right by the resource table, we have Victory Tumblers. That's our gift and a little welcome gift to you. Now as we go ahead and talk about something that's very important, I've been talking about this for months it's our church programs. Inside our church programs, we actually have a little contact sheet. Go ahead and tear that off and fill it out. It's a great way to stay connected with our church, asking for information about small groups and also prayer requests. I encourage every single person to fill one out. That way we can all get behind you. Now, as we look at the coming weeks and also more of a weekly schedule that we're going to be doing, specifically next week, we're going to be having a building project update. It's going to be very important for everybody who wants to hear what the status is currently of the building project. Go ahead and tend. It's going to be after Sunday service. Also, we're looking to strengthen the culture of prayer here at Victory. And as a result, we're going to be having weekly prayer meetings right before Sunday service. It's going to be around 930 o'clock in the morning. Go ahead and just get here a little bit earlier if you want to participate in that. I encourage everybody. Prayer is such a key aspect of the Christian life, and it's something that's, I'll admit it, very difficult to go ahead and have discipline above. It's something that you really have to be intentional with, 
and something that helps is having a, a group of people that you can participate that with. So I encourage everybody to go ahead and attend. I'll pass this off to Pastor Dave. Thanks, Morgan. All right, so just want to take a few minutes to go before the Lord and with our, with our offerings right now. And uh, this is one of those practices that we do to give back to God, thank Him for who He is, what He's done. Um, when we gathered this morning, we actually started that prayer meeting He's talking about last week. We started it, so this was our second week doing it. Um, for the foreseeable future, we're going to be praying every week at 9.30 a.m. It's actually 9, 9.30 sharp, so... Uh, me here with us to pray. But as we prayed this morning, we went through a season of thanksgiving to God where we were praying over things that we're thankful for. And one of the things that, that, that I found myself drawn to thank God for was that we have this space to meet in, that we have this equipment to broadcast and, and a, just a place that we can, we can regularly and consistently come to meet, even um, when, when we, we, we kind of found out that when we showed up that we couldn't use the parking lot, and so we kind of made adjustments, and thanks everybody for making those adjustments this morning, and, uh, but I'm thankful that we have this space that, that we can meet. That's a gift from God. It's a blessing. The school district has been really really uh, accommodating to us in so many ways. And so as we go to the Lord this morning, I just want to want to thank him um, for this space and for each of you and that we can gather on a weekly basis. And so as we gather this morning, may we be drawn to thank the Lord with our, with our tithes, with our offerings. Some of you practice the tithe where you, you, when you get paid, then you give 10% back to God. I just want to encourage you, whatever you can do, to give back to God. It's an expression of, of, of your faith, of your trust, and of your growing dependence on God uh, to lead you and guide you. So there's a couple of different ways that we can give. One is through our, our website at victoryanaheim.org slash donate. It's a secure platform that you can set up your recurring giving that way. And then we also have the giving box in the back of the room where you'll put your communication card as well. So God bless you as, you as you continue to worship, but as you worship him with your tithes and offerings, and please stand with us as the worship team leads us. Today he's going to share from Acts again today. And Acts 6, 4 talks about how the disciples were being devoted to prayer and preaching the word. This next song is new for us. It was written back in 2019. And as this group of songwriters, Christ followers, gathered together, they opened up their writing session with a word of prayer. And, and the, one of the people who prayed said, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. And that was in his prayer. And that prayer inspired this song. Well, prayer is powerful, as Morgan said. But it's not just like in the doing of it. It's because of to whom we're praying. We're praying to the most powerful one. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus talked about all the authority that he had was given to him by God the Father. And that's not to be taken lightly. And even though he had all of this authority, let's take a look and see his example of prayer. In Matthew 6, 10, he talks about the kingdom come, the Lord's prayer. I'm sure you all know that, but thy will be done. Jesus wanted the Father's will done. And then again in Matthew 26, 39, before he was getting ready to go to the cross, he prayed and he prayed. And it was with the utmost um, passion and, and conviction. And uh, he was sweating and bleeding. And he said, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Well, even as Jesus had all this authority, he submitted to God the Father. And that's such a sweet example for me, for you, for all of us to remember that as we pray, yes, we can pray for our, our hopes and wants like Jesus did here, but ultimately our hearts should be submitted to God, submitted to the one who created us. And in this song, I want to speak the name of Jesus. It's all about that, about submitting to God and saying, Lord, you have all authority and we give you our trust. So will you stand and, and, and worship the one who's worthy of our praise?
Addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name. Thanks, worship team. You know, in a, in a spirit of just kind of what, what that message, the message of that song, it's about a passion for the name of Jesus. And that kind of, of passion 
isn't the kind of thing that you're taught. It's the kind of thing that, you're, that you catch. It's the kind of thing that's cultivated in a heart that's drawn to God every, every day. It's by the actions we do, by the things that we say that glorify his name. Will you just join me in prayer as I, before I preach this word? Our God and our Father, I thank you for the way you work in our lives. Lord, I just want to say we need you, Jesus. You are good, and you are holy, and you are true. And Lord, you love us. You care for us in so many ways, even many times that we don't see or recognize. But Lord, I pray that we would be a people that respond to you with affection and with desiring you, with wanting you in our lives and your presence in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. And just people of God, before I end this prayer, I just want to say wherever you kind of came in today, whatever's happening in your life, You've got things that you're dealing with. Maybe some of you, it was, it was tough to even get here today, but you're here. And thank God for that. I pray that these moments that we have together, that you be able to focus, to focus on one thing, hearing from God. And I pray that as you hear from God, that you would be able to respond to God. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have here something, a little token that Mike Shry made for me. And it's, if you could see it up close, you would see that I have with me a little piece of, I don't know, what do you call that, plaster from a building? And it's got a picture of our old church building over at, on Magnolia, down the street at 227 North Magnolia, two blocks from here. And it's got a picture of it in the background, and it's got a piece of the building in this little plastic container. And when I, when I look at this, and, I, and I, I, I was looking at it the other day, and I was thinking, church. And I thought, isn't that funny, that la- how the way language plays out, that Jesus said, on my, on, on, on my, I will build my church. Jesus said that. And that he wasn't talking about a building when he said that. Jesus, when he said to Peter, he said, he said, Peter, on your confession, I will build my church. And that confession that Peter made was, 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 was that Jesus asked the question. He said, who do, who do people say that I am? And then Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said to Peter, blessed are you. Blessed are you. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And he said, and on this confession you've made, I will build my church. And, and, and it's, it's hilarious that, that we say, I'm going to go to church and we're thinking a building. It's, it's uncanny that, that all, every, probably every person in America that went to church services this morning, that they were going, they were thinking of a building when they said church. And, and Jesus never, ever communicated anything about buildings when he talked about church. This is a piece of a building that means something to, to, to people who call this their church. This building meant something because a lot happened in that building. I dedicated, um, I baptized my, my oldest son, David, who was up here worshiping. I baptized him in that building. I met my wife in that building, and we were married in that building, and I was ordained into the gospel ministry in that building that is represented by this little piece of rock. In this picture. But that building is, is not the church. And, 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 and the, the, um, we have to be careful 
about this, how our thinking about buildings is. Because I think that this season of our church life, I believe, is a, is a wonderful opportunity for our church to learn the lesson that churches are not buildings. And, and maybe, just maybe, God won't let us have a new building until we at, actually learn that lesson. Because I feel like this season for our church is, is a season where we're like Moses wandering in the desert. And the reason why, why Moses and the people of Israel, two million people wandered in the desert for 40 years, is because they refused to learn the lessons that God wanted to teach them. And so God said, I'm not going to let one person from that generation enter the promised land because they're disobedient and because they won't learn the lesson. And, and what, if, what if God was saying to us, people of victory, our church is called victory. We chose the name victory because, because we have a victorious life in Christ. Amen. It represents the kind of life, lives that we live in the name of Jesus, a victorious life. The, the Christian life is not the defeated life. The Christian life is not the mundane life. I dropped the building. <laughs> the Christian life is not a building. The Christian life is a victorious life in Christ. And you're meant for that victorious life. And you're meant to not just live a victorious life in Christ, you're meant to thrive with that victorious life in Christ. To thrive in your work and in your family and in all that you do. And so I want to remind us, church, as a pastor of our church, I feel like this is a, Moses and the people of Israel in the desert is a picture of our church in the season without a building. And we rely on the building so much for our identity as a church. And I just want to remind us that no building has ever been the identity of this church. And it should never be. And we have to listen to God, to what Jesus is saying to us. That when Jesus said, I will build my church, his picture was, I will build my people on this declaration that Jesus is Lord. He is the one true God. And so as I begin this message, this message is called the grit of growing. And, and, and in this message, we're, we're journeying through the book of Acts. And, this, and we're going through one, one, one week for every chapter of the book of Acts. And this is week six. And in week six... The word that, that, that I'm preaching to you is the word that's in the scriptures. It's not some topic that I want to preach. It's the, it's the topic that's there. And then I'm saying, Lord, what do you want to say to us this week? And so, so as we look at the book of Acts, one of the things I love about the book of Acts is that the book of Acts is in many ways a training manual for being church. The book of Acts, if we want to go, what should church look like? If we want to recover, what should church look like? Then we should be looking at the book of Acts and gaining insights and asking, Lord, how should we respond? What should we change? How should we adjust ourselves to you and what you're doing? And so this message is called the grit of growing. And, 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 I, and I want to say this, that every way a people will ever grow, whether we're talking about a person, think about a, your, your children when they were, when parents, when, when your kids were little, and the, the development of a child. And it, when you have a young child, all of us were young children at one time, it's gritty, it's messy, it's ugly. We make a mess of our food. 
Can you remember putting the, your child or being the child with the food? And, and it's, it's like, okay, it's time to eat. And we have these mechanisms that we put the children in when it's time to eat. These high chairs. And we, we fasten like this seatbelt thing on them. And we put this tray on them. And the kids are trapped in there. And then, and then we start putting food on there. On there and so, some parents are like, okay, you know, they're going to make a mess of this. So I'm going to like give them the food selectively and just give. But if you give them the food... What happens when they're a little baby and that if you give them the food, that food is all over their face and, and they start doing this on the tray and they throw the food down. It's like the food mess is all over the high chair. It's in their hair, on their face. David, I remember your, your, one of your birthdays, we, had, we gave you chocolate cake and it was exactly like what you would imagine. We said, okay, let's... Just let him have the chocolate cake. It's his birthday. And the kid took the chocolate cake, and it's like, it's all over him. I'm like, how do you get chocolate cake in your hair and stuff like that? It was everywhere. It was... <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's gritty when you're growing. And um, the way you grow, you can grow many different ways. But... The seasons of growth are important. When you think about Israel in the desert, it did not feel like they were growing. It did not feel healthy. It did not feel like something they wanted. In fact, many of the people said to Moses during those years when they were being formed by God, they said to Moses, Moses, we wish we would have never left Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt as slaves. They desired to go back as slaves rather than to be in the place of obedience to God. That's how, how gritty their lives were at that time for the people of God. And so we're going to look at this, at this chapter 6 of the book of Acts. I want to ask you to join with me as I, as I read from, I'm going to start with verses 1 through 6. I'm going to go ahead and read it. This message is the grit of growing, starting in verse 1 of Acts chapter 6. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Verse 2. And the twelve, that is the twelve disciples, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Verse 3, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, that is reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom you will appoint to this duty. Verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Verse 5, and what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Verse 6, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. All right, so it starts off, it says that there became a bit of a dissension in the church. There became a problem in the church. Problems arose in the early church. And, and, and there, were the, there were folks that brought a complaint. And with growth, there comes problems. And, and so the, the complaint was from this group of people named the Hellenists. Now, the Christian witness went beyond Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And as that happened, new people were coming to faith that weren't um, of, of the Hebrew people. And so there were now, there were Greek-speaking Jewish Christians. They were the Hellenists. So they were Jewish by ethnicity, but in their language that they spoke and the culture that was theirs, they were Greeks. And so they spoke Greek, and they, they, they were of the Greek culture. And so those are referred to as the Hellenists. And the gospel was proclaimed to an ever-widening 
territory. And so these, as different people came, you, you, they started including different cultures. Now, there's another people that it talks about in here in verse 1. It's the Hebrews. So we've got the Hellenists and we've got the Hebrews. The Hebrews were the group that were the early church. All of the 12 disciples were Hebrews. They were not Hellenists. Now, the Hebrews were native Palestinian Jews from that area of Israel, and they spoke Aramaic as their main language, and they attended Hebrew-speaking synagogues. They were not fluent in Greek. Many of them did not even know the language of Greek, uh, of the Greek language. Now, it says that the Hellenists were complaining against the Hebrews because the Hellenist widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The daily distribution was the ministry among the early church where there was a food distribution and a resource distribution to the needy within the church. So those who had need within the church had their needs met from within the church in this food daily distribution. Now, the growth of the church created problems. When the Hellenists responded to the gospel, there was a language barrier. So it would be like us in our day, in our church, and we go, Spanish-speaking people that came to faith and wanted to attend our church and were attending and coming, and they were getting by and they're speaking, but they only speak Spanish. And then when, when someone doesn't speak your language, then you have a problem. If, if our dominant language in here is, is English, and maybe some of us speak, okay, um, Nelly and John, you speak Romanian, and, and, and some of you speak Tagalog, and uh, what other language do we have in here? Do we have anybody in this room who speaks Spanish? Um, Tagalog? We have uh, the Indian language spoken in this, in this room. And so um, we, we have multiple languages that are spoken. But if you go, okay, if there's nobody in this room who speaks Spanish, and when the Spanish speakers come and they want to speak or come to, to faith and they want to learn, we would have a problem. And, and what tends to happen is, is if there's a language barrier and there's a bunch of people, it's kind of easy to ignore the people who are the odd person out that speak the other language. It's kind of easy to, to, to go to the people who you know you can speak the same language with. You share the same language and culture. And so what was happening here is as Hellenists came to faith, there were, there were widows among the Hellenists, and those widows were being ignored from within the church. Not by intention, it was just happening. It was just happening. And, and so, so then, the, the, in verse 2, the 12 apostles gathered the church and they called um, from among the Greek speaking, the Greek, Greek speakers of the church, they asked them to choose some leaders. They asked them to choose seven leaders who spoke Greek that were Hellenists, so they could attend to the needs specifically of the Greek-speaking widows that were coming to faith within the church. And, and, and so in, in verse 3, it's, they, they placed, the apostles placed three requirements on these, these leaders that they would choose. Three requirements, that they should be of good reputation, that they should be full of the Holy Spirit, and they should be full of wisdom. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. Think about that. Requirements to serve within the church. And at this time, this is, this is where, where, where we see the church in the growing pains of the church where they're starting to realize, okay, we need to have other leaders from within, within the church. The, the 12 apostles are, are, are doing their role and they're leading in prayer and they're leading in preaching the word to the, to the church and teaching the word so that, uh, one, so that the disciples can grow in the faith and two, so that new people can hear the gospel. And, and, and so they, there was a need for another layer of leadership within the church. So they said, let's choose seven who can serve this specific need. And it's interesting because the word that, that, that they used 
was actually a word that, that means serve. And it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Greek word, diakonos, from which we translated over to an English word called deacon. Deacon. And that's where we get the word deacon and the concept of deacon. This is where it comes from within the church. We have deacons within the church, that, and the word deacon means servant, servant. And, and so, so, so the apostles were calling for the church to raise up seven servants, seven deacons from among the church who would serve the needs of these Greek-speaking widows. And that would be their ministry, and they would be specifically geared toward that ministry, and they would serve to meet those needs of, those, of these constituents, these people, these church members, these disciples. And, and, and um, as they did so, they, re they, they required that they would be of good reputation. We don't want anyone to do this who has a bad reputation. We, if, if they have a bad reputation, that's not the person that we want to serve in this ministry. And, and then it, and it also says that they should be full of the Holy Spirit. And, and this phrase that we see pop up a lot in the book of Acts, full of the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They prayed and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We see men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says it over and over every chapter of the book of Acts. It talks about being filled with with the Holy Spirit. And if I ask you a question, I say, disciple, Christian, church member, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? I think that that's something we take for granted. I think we go, like, as Baptists, we kind of go, well, that's the Pentecostals. That's the Charismatics. We're not the Holy Spirit people. And I go, oh, really? Oh, really? We, we, we preach from the same word. Could it be that, that, that we've, we've allowed what, what we see in others that we go, well, I don't really like what I see going there, that we've allowed that to sort of cloud our own thinking about what God wants us to hear? Could that be that, 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 that we're, we're, we take for granted being filled with the Holy Spirit? Because it's interesting that, that, that the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit is one of the requirements. As in, there would be some people who would be among the church that aren't filled with the Holy Spirit. So only choose the ones that are of good reputation and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an important thing. Maybe it's something that God wants us to pay attention to, do you think, as we're going through the book of Acts right now? Maybe God wants us to hear something about the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit, but it also says that they should be full of wisdom. Do, is that ever a requirement when we think, okay, I want to get somebody to serve in the church, and we go, let's make sure that they're full of wisdom. Because some people, when they speak, they might be smart, but they're not full of wisdom. And, and, and it's not putting down somebody just that's, that's smart. It's just saying we want people with wisdom, that, that in their wisdom from their experience in life and from God working in their life and from their, their dependence on the Holy Spirit that these people can discern. They have discernment. You know, like we, we, like, as in we don't want people to go like, hey, we got a problem, what should we do? And, and here are the options. And they're like, yeah, either one sounds good to me. That's not wisdom. That's not wisdom. That's not wisdom. Wisdom speaks into the situation. Well, given who we are, and given our history, and given this person's reality, maybe we should do this. Oh, that sounds like wisdom. They made a case for it out of wisdom. You see, we're looking for leaders in the church who are wise. We're looking for moms and dads who are wise. We're looking for young people who are wise. And wisdom comes from discernment, from being filled with the Holy Spirit, and from obeying God. And so, so moving on, it, it says that the apostles in verse 4, the apostles focused primarily on a twofold work of this young church where they were devoting themselves to prayer and they were devoting themselves to the ministry of the word. I will be honest with you, the ministry of the word is difficult. It's difficult. The preparation required to preach the word of God is difficult and not to be taken for granted. There was a time in my life where I thought, I think I could get together a sermon in an hour or two. 
And then, and then those sermons were not meaningful sermons. Because it takes an understanding of the word and a study of the word and preparation in the word. It's not unusual for me to, to, to for this sermon, I invested about 12 hours of this past week into preparation for this sermon. 12 hours just for this sermon. That's one over one quarter of someone's work week just to put together a 30 minute sermon. Um, is that a worthwhile use of time? Is that, is that, is that something that, that, is, is, that someone should be you know, paid to do that? And someone should, we should look at our leaders and go, yeah, we want our leaders to be able to put this much time, energy, effort into the preparation to preach a 30 minute sermon. And, and, and that has, from, from the days of the apostles, it has always been something that God's people have looked at as a worthwhile investment of time, energy, and resources of our leaders to prepare for the word. And what the apostles were saying, they said, guys, we need to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. We need some of you to rise up and be leaders and go serve these widows, these poor widows that have need. And so they said, we're going to stay focused on the prayer and, and the ministry of the word while we need seven leaders from among you to be servants, deacons, who will serve the needs of the poor widows among us. And, and, and so that's what they did, and they chose these seven. And it's interesting, it tells us in verse 5, it names two of them specifically, it says Stephen and Philip. Those two, the first two that they name, will become prominent in the book of Acts. They both become very prominent in the book of Acts in the narrative of, of the weeks to come, the, the chapters to come. But the New Testament makes no mention of the other five after this time. Doesn't mean they didn't do anything significant. But there's no mention of them anywhere else in the New Testament, just when they were chosen as deacons. But we see that Stephen and Philip did some exceptional things, and then we see them rise to some prominence. In verse 6, it says that they prayed and laid hands on them. If I can talk with you just for a moment, I want to I tell you something about the laying on of hands that I think there may be something for us to, to, to gain here, to learn here. I looked up in the book of Acts when the church laid hands on people. When did it happen? And, and we find it in, in, in Acts 9, 17, they laid hands on people when they healed them. In, in Acts chapter 9, verse 17. Now, they also laid hands on people to receive the gifts of the whole, the gift of the Holy Spirit in chapter 8 and verse 18, verse also 9, 17 and 9, 6. They laid hands on people that they might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And remember, the, 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 the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, was one of the requirements of these deacons, that they be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says that, that, that they laid hands on people so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Well, has any, so there's picture in the book of Acts, we've got people who are, are saved. They come to faith in Jesus. Yes, I believe in Jesus and I want to follow Jesus. And then a separate experience, a separate time, a separate encounter with God and a separate experience within the church that, that, that the leaders laid hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. And, and this is another one of those things that we get afraid of being Pentecostal or we get afraid of being charismatic among the Baptist church, among Baptists. And in the scriptures here, there were no Baptists and there were no Pentecostals and there were no Charismatics. They were just followers of Jesus. And those followers of Jesus, as they followed God, as they followed God, they were obedient to God. When wrong thinking popped up, they confronted wrong thinking. When wrong teaching popped up, they confronted wrong teaching. But laying on of hands... To receive the Holy Spirit was not wrong thinking or wrong teaching or wrong action. And, and so, you know, that's something to chew on for us. And then also it says that when they commissioned folks to ministry, as in like right here, 
That's what happened. They laid hands on them when they commissioned these seven into ministry in Acts chapter 6, but also in Acts 13, 3, commissioning into ministry. They laid hands on them and commissioned them into their ministry. And, and, and so we see these three ways, these three uh, ways that, that the early disciples laid hands on people for healing, to be filled with the Spirit, and to be commissioned into ministry. And, 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 and as I was thinking about that, I go, sometimes we'll lay hands on people when we pray for healing. Sometimes we'll lay hands on people when we commission off into ministry. And that's it. And maybe we don't do it enough. But maybe we need to lay hands on people and pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so uh, it, what's happening here, we see the roles within the church are growing. And what, what, what I want to do with this passage, I just wanna, I'm going to give you one, one other section of this scripture. I'm going to skip down to uh, verse 8. This section called The Face of an Angel. And this is about a description of, of Stephen. And starting in verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Now remember, Stephen was one of those guys, one of those seven. And it says he was, he was, he was doing great signs and wonders. And then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it, as it was called, and of the Cyrenes, Cy Cyrenians, excuse me, and of the Alexandrians, and of those of Cilicia and Asia. They rose up and they disputed with, with, with Stephen. Verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Verse 11, then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Verse 12, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and they seized him and they brought him before the council. Verse 13, and they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak against this holy place and the law. Verse 14, and we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth We'll destroy this place and we'll change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Verse 15, and gazing at him, all who sat at the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So Stephen was the first listed among the seven Hellenists who were selected to be deacons, to minister to the widows. And like the apostles, he not only ministered to the widows, but was primarily concerned with the ministry of the word. And he preached Christ in the Greek-speaking synagogues of Jerusalem. And then they seized him and they dragged him before the authorities because of his preaching. In verse 8, specifically, it says, Stephen is described as being filled with faith and with the Holy Spirit. Uh, in verse 5, he's filled with faith and Holy Spirit. And then in verse 8, he's described as full of grace, power, and wisdom. So Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit, with faith, with grace, with power, and with wisdom. He's the first person after the apostles who performed signs and wonders in the New Testament. It says that he performed signs and wonders. His power was not physical strength. It's not like he was Samson. His power was not physical strength, nor was it worldly knowledge. And it was not social influence either, social influence. His power was because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was led by the Holy Spirit, and he was obedient to the Holy Spirit. And in verse 9, it says that he, he, he spoke, he preached in the, to the synagogue of the, of the freedmen. These were Jews who had been slaves, and they were granted their freedom. And the locations point to the dispersion of the Jews all over the world because the, the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, those were from North Africa. Cilicians and, and from Asia, that was modern-day Turkey. It says that as Stephen, this man filled with the Holy Spirit, this deacon filled with the Holy Spirit, who was preaching the word and people rose up against him, and it says that they secretly instigated 
They secretly instigated. It's talking about that they were putting words in other people's mouth. Hey, we want you to say this about Stephen. We want you to say these things about Stephen. So he gets into trouble, and he did get into trouble with the authorities for speaking against God and speaking against Moses and speaking against the temple. And it's interesting that that you notice that the same false charges that were brought against Jesus were these same charges. When they took Jesus, it was these same charges. And you know what that says to me? It makes me think that those who stand against God's people And I've found this true in my life. They say the same old things over and over again. People who speak against Christians, they say the same things. It's like a different person saying the same blah, blah, blah on a different day. They say the same, oh, Christians are hypocrites. Okay, now they got you on your, they want to put you on your heels. And you're like, well, I guess I know some Christians who are hypocrites. And you're on your heels. And say the same things to you. You get on your heels every time they say that garbage to you? Are you a hypocrite? I'm not. Because I'm saved by Christ. And every time I confess my sins, I'm clean. And so if someone points out your hypocrisy, confess your sins to Christ and be clean. And don't be bound by that garbage when somebody says, all Christians are hypocrites. Because then you get on your heels and you're like, yeah, 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 Christians are hypocrites. And you don't want to say anything. Guess what? Newsflash. Somebody's going to come to you when you tell them about your faith. And I don't go to church because all Christians are hypocrites. What are you going to say? You're going to get on your heels? Yep, they are. No. Stand in Christ. You know what? Some are hypocrites. And you know what? Thank God for the blood of Christ because we're cleansed and set free from our sin. You're a hypocrite in some ways too, aren't you? You know how you get clean from your hypocrisy person who's accusing the church of being hypocrites? By getting on your knees before the God who created you and asking for forgiveness because you need forgiveness. Tell them that. Be brave. Be brave. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what being filled with the Holy Spirit is about, that you have the courage to stand strong in the face of those who stand against you. What else are they going to say? What about all the atrocities throughout history that Christians have committed? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know what? What about all the great things Christians have done throughout history? Do you know that freedom from slavery is because of Christians? Do you know about that? Why aren't you talking about that? Freedom exists in the world because of Christians. Do you know that hospitals were invented by Christians? Universities were invented by Christians. What about that? Does that matter to you? Science was invented by Christians who wanted to understand God's world. What about that? Christians invented science. When people say Christians are anti-science, that's a fool who's speaking. Christians invented the scientific method. We live in a world where people who say people are anti-science, those people are anti-science. They just say science Like if it's some static thing that never changes. Science always changes. Science never draws conclusions that are finite because when you learn more things, you, you discover a wider view of the world. Guys, quit getting on your on your heels and being afraid. These Christians. Stephen stood strong and preached Christ to a hostile group that put him, wanted him in jail. And he still preached Christ. I just want to say, guys, opposition, this chapter starts with opposition from within the church. The church complaints of these Christians against those Christians. And then it ends with opposition outside the church. Opposition kept coming at the church from within the church and outside the church. Church, we have our own opposition. We have our own opposition. I'm like, I look at those empty seats next to you. I'm like, who's not here today? And why aren't they here? And I'm like, you know what? You can't compel or control someone, but maybe there's somebody you should call and go, hey, miss you at church today. Would love to see you there. Hey, there's a bunch of you guys online. Love that you guys are there. There's like as many people, I don't know, online as there, as there are in person. Maybe. But I just want to say, like, the opposition that we feel, it's worldly. And it's spiritual. 
because there are spiritual forces at work against the church. And, 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 and you go, some of us go, well, man, we're going to get that building project next week. Yeah, come for the building project. But I'm telling you, I'm going to call our church to prayer and fasting next week. That's a preview. Because we need some people on their knees praying, and we need some people fasting, seeking the Lord, like these Christians in the book of Acts. When I'm going through the book of Acts these, these last six weeks, it's compelling me. That's why I started this prayer meeting on, on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. Be here next week. Pray with us. There were six of us praying this morning at, 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 at 9.30 this morning out there for 20 minutes. Come and pray with us next week at 9.30. If prayer, you go, you know, Morgan said it, prayer is hard to develop. Prayer is hard to develop. It's a hard discipline. Yeah, there are a lot of disciplines that are hard to develop. Working out is hard to develop. And, and eating right is hard to develop. And drinking water instead of unhealthy drinks is hard to develop. And going to sleep at a decent time is hard to develop that habit. And prayer is hard to develop. And reading the word is hard to develop. And being consistent in your church attendance is hard to develop. And giving back to God is hard to develop. But you know what? Those habits are worth it. And it's the grit that makes growth possible. When God's people will put the work in, the hard work in. You know what? There's a place that that we all want to go. Man, we want that building to be built. But we must remember That building is not our identity. The building that we will get one day is not our identity. But we need to come together in prayer and fasting. Be here next week for that as we begin that season of prayer and fasting. I just want to call on God's people to be who we're meant to be and live the kind of life that we're meant to live in the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen on that? So I want to take a few minutes and just close out this service. I want to ask you for to invite you to a season of prayer with me. In response to God. When I read God's word and I look at, I, I unpackage this chapter for you. So you gain some glimpses into God's heart for the early church. And God's work in the early church. And the apostles, you, you get to a sense for what, how they thought. And how they organize themselves. And may we be a church that, 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 that just first and foremost seeks God with all our heart like Marcia sang about. Seeks Jesus with all we've got. And I pray that we would be a people who can respond to God in that way. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes as we pray? Our God and our Father, we need you, Lord. We need you. We need you because we live in a world that's antagonistic toward you and toward churches and toward goodness. And Lord, we want to be a people who seek you and bring glory to your name with our lives. We want to be a church that is a presence that connects with our community. Lord, we want to see people in our community coming to faith in great numbers like the early church. But we want to see it happening because the church is a great witness to you and your greatness every day in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces and in our school places and everywhere we go. May we be a people who witness to your greatness. May we be a people who invite people to come to Jesus. Lord, I just repent of every moment that I've been afraid. Lord, I long to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I long to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we praise you. We love you and we adore you. People of God, wherever you are with God, I pray that you would be able to respond to God in some way today because I think that if unless you're you're living an Acts chapter 6 kind of life like Stephen, we probably have some repenting to do. We probably have some getting on our knees and seeking God to do. And, 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 and I, would, I would say that we are meant, you are meant to live an Acts chapter 6 kind of life like Stephen. Filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with wisdom of good reputation and doing great things and speaking the word boldly. And filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
That's the kind of life we're meant to live. And I'm just going to throw this out at the conclusion of the service, right after we're done. If anybody wants to come, come up. And I just want to pray over you, lay hands on you, and pray that you be filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray if you want to come, I'm going to be standing right here at the end of the service. Anybody who wants to come and be prayed upon and your hands play, prayed on, maybe some of our deacons come and join me. Just if we take a quick minute before we start putting everything away, give folks a chance to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just for someone to lay hands on them and pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our church. I pray, God, that as we respond to you, that you would do great things among us. I pray that we would be men and women, boys and girls who are filled with the Holy Spirit. That lack, no, that lack no courage to go and stand tall for you by your power, by your greatness, and by your love. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. You know, I usually give folks the opportunity that if you've never put your faith in Jesus, to do so. I'm looking at everybody here, and I know you've put your faith in Jesus. And, and, and it says that, hey, let's invite some people who need to be here that haven't put their faith in Jesus. I don't know if there's somebody online, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, but I urge you to do so. Somebody who's watching this at a future date, put your faith and trust in Jesus by saying yes to Jesus, by saying, yes, Jesus, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus, I want to live my life for you. Yes, Jesus, I need you in my life. Come and be my Lord. Amen. God bless you. Will you rise and sing with us? I remember how you told me that life may not be easy and everything that I need you've already given me I remember how you told me I could trust you completely so why am I doubting you prove that you'd fight for me you walk me through fire you pulled me from flame if you're in this with me i won't be afraid when the smoke billows higher Going higher and it feels like I can barely breathe. I walk through these fires cause you're walking with me. I'm changed by your mercy. I'm covered by your peace. I'm living out the victory doesn't mean I won't feel the heat you walk me through fire you pulled me from flame if you're in this with me I won't be afraid when the smoke billows higher and it feels like I can barely breathe I walk through these fires Cause you're walking with me I can face anything Cause you're here with me I can do all things Cause you strengthen me I remember how you showed me The price of my redemption Lord, how could I question When you prove that you would die for me Sing it, church You walk me through fire Put me from flames. If you're in this with me, 
I won't be afraid When the smoke billows higher Oh, and higher And it feels like I can barely breathe I walk through these fires Cause you're walking with me yeah, yeah. I walk through these fires Cause you're walking If anybody has accepted Jesus today, I'd like to be the first to welcome you to the family of God. Now, as we look towards this week, I have a little bit of a story to tell. It's very short, but yesterday, I really wanted to do something, something that was inappropriate for me to do. And I had a very close friend. His name is Miguel. He, he used to come here. He's out in Florida now. And he, he told me, Morgan, what are you doing? Are you an idiot? Do you know what you stand for? Do you know who you are? And my first instinct was anger. I looked at him and thought, how could you tell me, a grown man, what I'm supposed to do? And I really digested that for a moment. And I figured, if somebody is your brother and sister in Christ, they will love you enough to call you out in error. So I tell you, in your personal relationships, in your life, if you have somebody, a very close friend who tells you something, something that you want to do is wrong, Know that oftentimes it's coming from Christ. Know that oftentimes you have to take that with grace because they care for you and they love you, as hard as it is. So walk in faith, hope, and love, church. Proclaim Jesus, church.